Hello, my name is Dan. I'm with the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences. This is the first in what will hopefully be a series of webinars on research methods, design, statistics, and related subjects uh, in support of strategic initiative at the university to support faculty research. Our topic for today is going to be reading a summary ANOVA table. There is a picture of me. Sorry about my luck. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the EDD, Doctorate of Education, and DHSC, Doctorate of Health Science. Uh, we want to make these webinars also available to folks potentially outside USA, uh, potential candidates looking at our program. So if the EDD or DHSC interests you, please just feel free to Give me a telephone call, uh, send me an email, you'll see my email address there. If you're interested in other program offerings at USA, there you'll see our 1-800 number and our college website. I would love to hear from you. Where to begin and why summary ANOVA table? And thinking about what this first one was going to be, of course, the idea of Lewis Carroll, the exchange between the right white rabbit and the king came to mind. <laughs> where the rabbit asked the king, where shall I begin, your majesty? And then the king said grave, gravely, begin at the beginning and go on until you come to the end, then stop. It's a little difficult to do that in research methods and statistics. We kind of have to start someplace. But uh, we have, have another little antidote that really helps explain why I'm beginning here. Um, my son has grown. He has two sons of his own. But when he was small, I think he was in like the second grade, we were out, in a, uh, out with my parents, and uh, my dad had a CB radio in his van. Uh, Ken was sitting between uh, Grandma and Grandpa, and he was hanging on to the CB mic. And my dad pointed out that there was a jet flying up that he could see in the window. And Ken grabbed the mic and keyed it, and he says, What are you guys doing up there? Are you goofing around and eating bananas? And of course, kind of an unseemly statement coming from such a small kid. My mom got quite a kick out of it. But I want to come back to this idea of what are you doing? Messing around, eating bananas as we get to the end of this. Thanks. Well, here's a summary of NOVA table. If you're reading quantitative research and if they're using parametric statistics, someplace along in the results, you're going to see a summary ANOVA table. Uh, the question for us, I'll tell you a little bit more about the study in a bit, but the question for us is where did that total sums of squares come from? Uh, what is that 30? Where did that 30 come from? And what in the world is a sum of squares? So in the screens to come, that's what we're going to be talking about. So here's my little study. Uh, we only have 10 subjects. We'll actually use their names. The dependent measure in the study is student satisfaction. So I have a measure of student satisfaction. And what I'm interested in is to what degree does achievement style uh, predict student satisfaction? So I'm going to use regression and regress, regress achievement style on satisfaction. You can see here that the, uh, the sum for satisfaction is 40. That means the mean is four. Uh, a mean is a best linear unbiased estimator and that's a foundational concept in research methods and statistics. So we're going to visit that as well. So let's graph our data. We can take our subjects in the study and put them on the horizontal axis and then plot their student satisfaction uh, up on the vertical scale. As you see, the, the line in purple is our mean, so we can see how student satisfaction scores are scattering around the mean. Same graph as before, but this time I'm asking you uh, to train your eye to the number of units both above and below the mean for any one of these satisfaction scores. So let's just look above the mean first. So for Jim, we have plus three, for Alice plus one and for Mark plus three. So 
the number of units above the mean line is 7. And then let's turn our eye to below the mean. So we have minus 2, minus 1, minus 2, minus 1, minus 1. We have 7 below the mean. So we have the same number of units of deviation both above the mean as below the mean. The very definition of a mean as a best linear unbiased estimator is that it minimizes, uh, it minimizes error. So if we had an 11th and 12th subject standing in a hallway for which we're going to have a student satisfaction score, if we had to make a guess as to what would be their uh, satisfaction score, we are probabilistically best to guess the mean. Okay? That's a central idea of blue. Now let's take this same data and put it in table form. So here we have the raw satisfaction scores. Right beside it is the mean. And then we're finding the deviation from that mean. And as mentioned, the mean minimizes the errors, both plus and, and minus. Therefore, by definition, the sum of the deviations from the mean has to be equal to zero. Well, mathematically, we can't deal with zero. Uh, so what we need to do is to square that. And when we square each of those deviations, we get a sum of 30. So there you see it. So here's where we have the correspondence. The summary ANOVA table tells us that there were 30 sums of squares uh, in the dependent measure, and now we can see exactly where that came from. When students take my course, I ask them kindly to please don't tell people how simple statistics really is, because I still make money at doing it as contract work. For all parametric statistics, they're the same. They're going to come in the form of a ratio. The ratio is of the signal over the noise. So in what we have here, we know that total sums of squares in our dependent measure is our measure of noise. It's our measure of variance that has to be accounted for. Uh, in the summary ANOVA table that you've seen, we found that the regression, which would be achievement style, that was the variable that we regressed on the dependent measure, accounted for 20.056 sums of squares. So we had 30 units of noise, and we accounted for 20.056 of that. That's pretty darn good. So the ratio of signal over noise is a central metaphor. It's foundational to everything that we do in quantitative research. Now we can start thinking about our different sort of studies and ask at any given time uh, just how noisy our dependent measure might be. And of course what came to mind immediately was something like low back pain. But we ask about the noisiness of the dependent measure uh, relative to the strength, the predictive strength of our independent measures. So sometimes we can have uh, noisy dependent measures but very powerful predictors and if that's the case we do pretty well. Uh, noisy dependent measures and relatively uh, weak predictors, we spend a lot of time trying to uh, sort things out. So my goal in these webinars is to talk about different ideas for reducing noise. We can do that through both design and mathematics. And some of the ideas for increasing signal strength, again, through design and mathematics. So let's go back to our question here. I'm interested in to what degree can student achievement explain variance in student satisfaction scores? So we're going to use SPSS, and we're going to use the analysis simple regression. Of course, uh, regression is just a correlation that happens to draw a line of best fit. We use SPSS, extremely powerful piece of technology. And thankfully, with SPSS, uh, we can graph these relationships as well. So satisfaction is on a vertical axis, dependent measure in our independent variable achievement style is on horizontal axis. We can see uh, the regression line 
and then we can see the scatter around that line. So the scatter is relatively tight, and if you can see in the upper right-hand corner, it tells us that the R squared is 0.669. So as you recall, uh, R is not directly interpretable. We have to square that number to get the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. This tells us how much overlap there is between the independent and the dependent measure. And in this case, quite a bit. So we have quite a bit of exp explanation power. If you work with SPSS, you also know that it gives us other output as well. It t actually tells us what the R square is uh, in our relationship. But we wouldn't need that particular table because we can derive it mathematically uh, again by uh, taking how much we have accounted for, the regression, 20.056, and dividing it by our total sum of squares happens to give us the same R squared. Okay, word of warning. We never, never, never want to confuse uh, measures of effect size, strength of a relationship in a correlation, or an, uh, a difference between means in a, in a test of the difference between means. We never want to confuse effect size with p-values or probabilities. Uh, this is a student mistake, uh, and students keep making it, but so we don't want to conflate those two things. So in a future webinar, I'm going to address that directly. So we answered the question earlier where the sum of squares come from for the dependent measure, the 30. Uh, what we haven't answered is where the sum of squares comes from for the regression coefficient achievement. So let me, let me give you a little screen on that one. To calculate the sum of squares due to the regression or a predictor, again, we have to create uh, more deviation sums of squares and including the deviation sums of squares associated with the cross product. Ultimately, what it takes is it takes a little bit of algebra. However, uh, SPSS doesn't even use algebra. It has a real powerful calculus kernel inside of it, and it can calculate these things at a level of precision that we just were not able to do with standard algebra back in the day. So uh, thank the stars for something as powerful as SPSS. It makes it so easy for us, but still requires us to understand what is foundationally going on inside of it. All right, my friends, let's get to the central teaching point here. The purpose of science is to explain that which was previously unknown. The student satisfaction by itself told us that there was 30 sums of squares and that there was 30 units that needed to be explained. It just so happened we got really lucky and uh, or were really bright and we found out that uh, achievement style explained for 20.056 of that 30. That's magnificent. The amount of error that we have left over is 9.944. So only in science can we quantify our error, our ignorance. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, so that nine is represented by those little orange lines. So our prediction, our best linear unbiased estimator now is not the mean for sum of squares, but it's the regression line. Again, this is a central metaphor. If we're not in the business of, of accounting for new variants, then, to quote my son, we're just messing around and eating bananas. Okay, this ends this first webinar. Thanks for being with me.